invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9 as we continue our life-changing look at Jesus. I know we've been bouncing around from Matthew to Mark. Matthew and Mark, by and large, cover the same stories, uh, the same events. One might say it, though, slightly different. And so I get to pick which one we're going to look at each week as we go through this life-changing look at Jesus. This morning, it's Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. This is God's word, beginning in verse 30. They, and that's Jesus and his disciples, they went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve. And he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. In this passage, Mark presents us with two scenes, two scenes that are very opposite of each other. In the first scene, Jesus speaks of his humiliation, the great humiliating act of the cross. And in the second scene, we find the disciples arguing over their greatness, over who is the greatest. Yes, these two scenes could not be more opposite Jesus speaks of being rejected, of suffering, of being murdered. The disciples, on the other hand, they voice their ambitions, their status, their prestige. Jesus speaks of laying down his life for others. And the disciples talk about a fulfilled life for themselves. Jesus, he is found counting the cost of the Calvary Road. The disciples are trying to figure out its benefits. Church, even after spending three years with Jesus, the disciples are still as foolish as ever. Missing the point of their lives, of their calling, arguing with each other, misunderstanding their purpose, their mission, their hearts focused on the wrong things. And yet there is Jesus right there beside them, patiently teaching them, bearing with them leading them. Church, this is more than a story in the Bible. This is a picture of our lives. We're going to use two headings to help us work through this passage. Heading number one is this. The question the disciples are afraid to ask. The question... The disciples are afraid to ask. We'll use that heading to work through verses 30 to 32. And then with the rest of the verses, we'll use this heading, heading number two. The question 
the disciples are afraid to answer. So in the first scene, they're afraid to ask, and in the second scene, they're afraid to answer. Let's dig in to heading number one. The question the disciples are afraid to ask. Look back at verse 30. It tells us that they went from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know. For he's teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. Verse 30, it essentially tells us that nobody knows where Jesus and his disciples are at this point. Not even us. And we even have a handy map in our pocket. Those who know, know. Jesus, he's facing a harsh reality, and that is that his time on planet Earth is coming to a close rather quickly. And he has history-making and world-changing information that he needs to get into the heads and into the hearts of these 12 guys. He's had a hard time getting it in there. And so he gets away with them so he can have their undivided focus attention. Meanwhile, so to speak, Jesus pulls out his GPS and he puts in Jerusalem. He's heading for Jerusalem. It's going to take him a little while to get there. It's going to take a while for us to get there with him. But he knows that once he gets there, he's going to be crucified on a cross, raised from the dead, and then 40 days after that, he will ascend to the right hand of his Father in heaven. But practically speaking, that means he's gone. He's gone. And at that point, it's going to be up to the 12 knuckleheads, the disciples, to advance his message and his mission all over the world. And so Jesus is getting them ready. Now, you guys know that he's already tried to explain his death, his burial, his resurrection once already back in Mark chapter 8, verses 31, 32. That didn't go well. You remember that Peter rebuked him harshly and said, Jesus, that's never going to happen. They get in that argument, that fight. Jesus calls him the devil, Satan. As a result, morale was low. So a week later, Jesus takes his leadership team, Peter, James, and John, up on the mountain. He's transfigured. He's got God the Father there, he's got Moses there, and he's got Elijah there, and they're all confirming that he, Jesus, is in fact the Son of God. God the Father actually speaks and tells the disciples, this is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. You need to listen to him. And so this morning, in our text, they're down off the mountain, they're making their way through Galilee, and Jesus, he pulls his 12 disciples away from the crowds, no fighting for their attention, and he gives them round two of his instruction on his death. Look at verse 31. He was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. Who delivered the Son of Man into the hands of men? Who delivered Jesus over to be killed? We could say that Judas delivered Jesus over to the hands of men. And that would be correct when it comes to a human element to the equation. But as you know, there is so much more going on. 
The phrase that Jesus uses is going to be delivered. Those five words, they translate one Greek word in the original. And scholars, men that are far smarter than I am, they call that one Greek word, the tense that it is in, a divine passive. And I'm not going to pretend to know what a divine passive is. I'm just going to tell you the nuts and bolts of it. It means that God is doing the action and man is passive. Which means that God, I'm sorry, Jesus in the form, God the Son, let's leave it at that, God the Son, is saying that God the Father is the one doing the action. He's the one doing the delivering, and the ones receiving are the hands of men. The hands that will kill him. In other words, it's God's plan. It's his action to hand the son to the men to kill him. There's a thought. What father does that? Now this is backed up by other scriptures. In Acts chapter 2, verse 23, Peter's preaching. Jesus has now gone home to heaven. In Acts chapter 1, they receive the indwelling Holy Spirit, and now he's out preaching the first sermon after Jesus has returned and he's received the Holy Spirit. And in the middle of that sermon, in Acts chapter 2, verse 23, he says that Jesus was delivered up. So there's our word. Jesus was delivered, handed over, delivered up, according to what? According to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. It's God's plan. And then he says, you crucified him, you killed him by the hands of lawless men. So church, who delivered Jesus over to the hands of lawless men? To have him killed? Answer, ultimately, is God did. And why would he do such a thing? Well, those of you who have been in church for a long time know the answer. He did it to rescue us. To save us. And that is the great and glorious news that I trust we never tire of hearing the news that God so loved the world that he gave, that he delivered up his son so that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send, he did not deliver, hand deliver his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Church, that is the good news of the gospel. It testifies to the love of God. But on the other side of the love of God is the hatred of man. For man so hated God that they murdered his only begotten son. Murdered our Savior. Have you ever thought about how blind that move was how evil that move was who does that who murders 
their Savior. This past week, I went to a movie. I don't go to very many movies, but I like war movies, and there's a decent one out right now about war, the war in Afghanistan. And at one point in the movie, the bad guys, they were moving in on the good guys, the Americans. And the bad guys, they killed all the good guys except for two. Now later on in the movie, those same bad guys, they caught up with those two good guys. And the good guys, they were fighting they're trying to save a woman and her baby. And they're running out of ammo. And their death was imminent and it was certain. That's when their savior appeared in the form of a helicopter. And it came swooping in, destroying all of their enemies. And it came to earth and it loaded them up rescued them, and flew them off to safety. Now, have you ever seen a movie where the good guys, the guys on our team, they're pinned down by the enemy, needing rescue, and as their Savior shows up, they pull out bazookas, point it at their Savior, and blow them out of the sky? No! Who does that? We did. You see, what often gets lost on us is the fact that Jesus' 12 Jewish disciples and the religious leaders who killed Jesus, they were on the same team. Or at least they thought. The disciples thought they were on the same team as the elders and the scribes and the chief priests who would lead Jesus away, lead that charge to crucify him. You see, both the Jews, I'm sorry, both the disciples and those religious leaders are Jews. Both the disciples and the religious leaders are looking for the Messiah. As a matter of fact, it's the Jewish leaders who taught the disciples to look for the Messiah and taught them what to look for. And now the disciples are sure that they found the Messiah. They've confessed him to be the Messiah And now Jesus is telling his disciples that their team, the so-called good guys, the Jews, they're going to put their Savior in the crosshairs of their bazookas. This would have been incomprehensible. This would be like all the world voting for Donald Trump. And then Donald Trump taking America and handing it to Vladimir Putin and saying, make us Russia. It would never happen. Do you know what I'm saying? Incomprehensible. Would it make any sense? That's the level of what Jesus is saying to these disciples. He's saying, my people are going to kill me. Which is why verse 32 says, they did not understand the saying. It's not because they were dumb. It was so otherworldly. They did not understand. And they were afraid to ask him. Church, this is the question the disciples were too afraid to ask. Now, I want to pause here for a moment 
And I want to give you a point of application. You need to listen carefully because this application can be taken too far. Here's what I want to point out to you. Do you know what's keeping the disciples from believing Jesus? Their preconceived, erroneous theological convictions. You see, they had an idea, they had an understanding, which, by the way, was put in their heads, put in their hearts by the religious leaders of what Jesus should be and do. Jesus is saying, I'm not being or doing what you think I should be. And they failed to understand. Where, where's the application, Pastor? Here's the application. We can fall into the same trap. What do I mean? I mean sometimes the religious leaders that we look to put an idea in our head build a conviction in our heart that's different than what Jesus says. And my question for you this morning is do you bend and shape and mold your religious convictions to Scripture? Or do you twist Scripture to fit your wrong? convictions do you trust your theological expert more than you trust Jesus I want to be very very careful here because strong religious biblical convictions are very important and necessary. And I want to encourage you to develop strong biblical convictions. But on your journey, make sure your heart stays soft rather than hard. Other words, you might just allow your theology to shape the Bible rather than allowing the Bible to shape your theology. Now, I'm treading on very dangerous ground. As a matter of fact, I am trying to walk along a razor's edge because I know that if we fall to the left and all of a sudden we throw out theology, we're going to come up with all kinds of heretical ideas, wrong ideas of Jesus. But if we fall to the other side of the razor's edge, we might just go walking into eternity blindly with our convictions and be rather confused with what we see happening in heaven. And so, I simply want us to pause and ask ourselves, are we teachable? Are we yielding to this book? Or are we somehow trying to get this book to yield to us? Let's not fall into the same trap as disciples, the disciples here, when they heard Jesus but did not understand. That's enough of that. Let's go to heading number two. Heading number two, the question the disciples are afraid to answer. The question the disciples are afraid to answer. Verse 33 says, And they came to Capernaum, and when they, he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? And so they make it back to the house that's most likely Peter's house. And they come to Capernaum, and that's where Jesus asks, what were you all talking about on the way to the house? And apparently, Jesus turned southern because he said, y'all, all right, you guys aren't listening. Come on, come back to me. He asked them, what were you guys talking about? But they were afraid to answer. It says that they kept silent. They kept silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. That's one of the most surprising sentences I've read in a long time. Jesus asked a question, and they kept silent. 
Who has the audacity to ignore Jesus besides me? You see, this is precisely, this is precisely where your sin, my sin leads us. To ignore Jesus, even though he's right here beside us. Hebrews 13.5, it tells us that he never leaves us. And yet, time and time again, day after day, our sin makes us leave, makes us ignore him. Just like we see the 12 doing here in this text. And I want to ask you, how much of your day is spent ignoring Jesus? He never leaves us. How much of your day do you go through pretending like he's not here? Ignoring him. Our silence towards him speaks volumes. It tells us what we really believe. So his disciples have been arguing with one another about which one of them is the greatest. Now they're arguing which one of them is the greatest instead of, you know, uh, 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 thinking about, contemplating Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection, what he just got done explaining to them. So instead of figuring out what Jesus was trying to communicate to them, they find themselves instead like a group of school children fighting, arguing over which disciple is the best disciple. Who's, who's going to be team captain? Can you imagine Jesus having this private, teachable moment with them? And they getting up, the disciples getting up after the service, if you will. And instead of thinking about and discussing and contemplating the great eternal truths that Jesus is pouring into them, they get up and they start argue, arguing, fighting over which one of them's the best. How vain is that? But church, how many times has my vanity, has your vanity, has my ambition, your ambition, gotten in the way of what God is trying to get in you? We get up and we act as if he hasn't spoken. They were silent. But even in their silence, even in my silence, even in your silence, Jesus sits down and helps. Verse 35, and he sat down, he called the 12, and he said to them, if anyone would be first, You want to be the best? You want to be the greatest? Here's how. He must be last of all and servant of all. I read this and I think to myself, oh, you want to fight? Disciples, you want to fight? You want to be the greatest? Let's merge those two things together. Fight. Fight to be the greatest. Fight. Not those around you, but yourself. Fight. Fight your desire to be first. Fight your cravings to be served. Fight. 
fight to be last. And you'll come in first. Church, Jesus invites us to fight to be last in your home. Fight to be last at work, on your team, on your street. He says you must take on the mindset of a servant. You serve everyone. You know, mindset, it's one of those buzzwords. I hear about mindset all the time on the podcast, the influencers, the self-help gurus are saying, you got to get your mindset right. Jesus is telling you what mindset his followers have. They have the mindset of a servant. Serve everyone. You walk through the doors of your house, mindset, servant. You walk through the doors of the church, mindset, servant. Everyone in this house, everyone in this room, everyone in this church, mindset is that everyone else is more deserving and needs, deserves to have my help. Serve them. Servant of all. What's interesting is this Greek word here for servant, it's not what some of you might expect. It's not the Greek word doulos. Some of you are familiar with that word doulos. A doulos is a bond slave, somebody who can be sold into slavery, somebody who's a servant against their will. That's not the word Jesus uses. He uses the word diakonos. It's where we get our English word, deacon. Listen, this is taking on the form of a servant, and it's not against your will. This is service that is, is not obligation. This service is not your job. It's your choice. It's not your responsibility. It's your joy. It's your joy. Diakonos, a life devoted to serving others because you love them like Jesus loves you and serves you. Listen, church, you fight off your love for self so you can win the fight to love others. And I'm using that word fight very intentionally. I can see myself in the battle. I can see myself laying on my couch after church with an empty glass. Samuel! Hey, could you come here for a second? Would you be a blessed servant and go get dad something more to drink? Meanwhile, modeling him to him the wrong thing that it's more blessed to get served than it is to serve. Win the fight. Fight your love of self. Fight to win, to love others. Jesus says the way that you win the battle, the way you win the race, the way you become great is to be last of all, the servant of all. You want to be best? You want to be first? Then live life in last. Next to him.
At no point does the way of Jesus confront and contradict the way the world views greatness. He confronts it and he contradicts it and he shows us that one, he's not against greatness. As a matter of fact, we could argue that he died to make us great. He just doesn't define greatness the way the world defines greatness. And so, child of God, let me invite you to be great. Be great at the things that matter to God. And nothing is greater than God, in God's eyes than giving yourself to the service of others, of laying down your life in love for others. You see, loving God and loving others comes down to one description, one descriptor, servant of all. Christian, we leave no job for someone else to do. We serve all. As a matter of fact, the more common, the more humble the job, the greater the deed. The more we're able to put Christ on display, who is enjoying all the glories of heaven, yet made himself to be a servant. Why? That he might serve the world. The more humble the deed, the greater our opportunity to put him on display to those around us. You see, loving, humble service, this is how we imitate our Lord and fulfill his mission. We'll read later in Mark chapter 10 about how the Gentiles, unbelievers, when they have a person in leadership, they lord it over the people. They boss them around. They use their authority. But he says in 1043, but it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So Christian, listen to Jesus. Be great. Be great. By being last, by being a servant to all. I'm going to tell you anything less fights against Christ and his work. He ends. His little lesson here with an illustration found in verses 36 and 37 to help us evaluate whether or not we've received him and his ways into our lives. It says, he took a child and put him in the midst of them and taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me and whoever receives me receives not me but him who sent me. Disclaimer here, I love kids, but kids are needy. The younger a kid is, the needier they are. Helpless, in fact, soiling themselves, constantly hungry, always taking, leaving a mess in their wake, and contributing very little to society. Last Sunday, after the service, I asked an eight-year-old girl if she had a job yet. 
And she looked at me like I was the crazy one. (laughs) These kids are free riders. They expect everyone to wait on them hand and foot. Jesus loves the little children. And he's telling us that if we want to be like him, then we better love and serve one another like a tender, caring mother cares, serves for her precious little child. If you were to look around the room and see what I see right now, you would see a room full of God's precious children. And he's calling me and he's calling you to serve them. And when you do, you'll be following in the ways of Jesus. You'll be following in the ways of God. You know, there's somebody who wins the argument the disciples were having. His name is Jesus. He's better. He's greater than anyone in every way. And if you want to be great, live your life like his. Last place, servant of all. Let's follow in the footsteps of our Lord. Starting today, we're going to close this. We're going to eat some crackers and drink some non-alcoholic wine. And then we're going to get up and we're going to be different. And then you're going to go home and you're going to be different. And tomorrow you're going to wake up and you're going to do whatever it is you do on Mondays. And you're going to be different. You're going to be like Jesus. You're going to be great. Let's pray. God, make us great. Make us great. Not like the world defines it. But as you define it, help us to be last of all, servant of all. Help us to be like Jesus. Amen.